Welcome to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. Whether you nerd out on it or just want to know more about it, we talk to some of the best minds in meteorology, space, and science to get answers on everything you've wanted to ask. And today, we're talking about aviation and air travel and how the weather can impact you when you're traveling through the air. And joining us as our expert in this episode is longtime pilot Steve Fleischel to give us some insight on weather and aviation from the pilot's seat. So Steve, thank you so much for making time for us. My pleasure, thank you for having me. Well, it's uh, great talking to you. And Steve, your resume is very impressive. We understand that you were born and raised in DeLand, Florida, uh, went uh, to Clemson and earned a degree in electrical and computer engineering, which is not an easy task, before heading to the Air Force, where you then flew C-131s in the 1970s. After the Air Force, you started a career with Delta Airlines, where you flew the Boeing jets, uh, uh, including the 727, 757, 767, and even the 777, and then the McDonnell Douglas MD-11. These are big planes. All of that has led you to logging over 25,000 flying miles. Uh, what a career and great knowledge base to draw from. So we're honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, let's get to it. And how much weather training does a pilot have? Is it more intense and thorough depending on the type of plane and the purpose of their flying? Absolutely. The, uh, when you first start with the airline, the weather training is more intense, of course, they want you to, to uh, be aware of all the particulars that that particular airline uh, wants you to know about. And then uh, once you pass the initial training and uh, are tested on that, then every year when you go back for what we call recurrent training, you uh, are also exposed to updates to that information uh, new products that are available, uh, new sources that uh, come online that can be can be helpful to you. And it also involves the different areas that the airline might fly to that could be new. Maybe now you're going to be doing more trips to South America and the weather is different there than it is perhaps to Europe where fog might be a, an issue in the wintertime. Uh, South America has convective thunderstorms in the summer that are concerning. So they cover all the differences and the different parts of the world. And everyone is exposed to that kind of information uh, with recurrent training and on a regular basis. <clears throat> and on an operational level, uh, before a flight, what kind of weather information do you get? And uh, who do you get that from? Is it from, from when you work with Delta? Would it be from Delta or would you get it from air traffic control? Really many different sources. Delta would, of course, use information from the National Weather Service, and uh, they had their own meteorological department. So a lot of that information uh, from multiple sources was revealed to us in printed form on a flight plan. We would want to see uh, the forecast weather for when we were going to arrive at a, any given destination. And there would be several lines for the the time before and when you would arrive and the time after. So a forecast, a current observation. We would also get convective activity charts that would show where the weather is and uh, in a printed form as well. But also uh, we have uh, on board, of course, weather radar and uh, our that's a very helpful tool of, to needless to say, but uh, be, but before the flight, it's pretty much a printed uh, uh, portrayal. International would involve other uh, products like turbulence uh, predictions that uh, we would also get as well. And as you're progressing through a flight, how much responsibility do you have in terms of monitoring the weather versus uh, having others uh, dictate uh, where you might travel through air traffic control or the FAA? Well, it's a, I think it's an interesting and a, and a very effective system where there is a FAA licensed position called a dispatcher. And that uh, position uh, involves a, a person who is required to monitor a, a flight that he is assigned to uh, and from the time it leaves until it arrives at the destination. And that dispatcher has a joint responsibility with the pilot in command 
to make sure that the safest possible route is selected. And as situations change, the dispatcher may actually have a unique and and better perspective than I would have in my immediate area as to what's coming up, let's say, for an international flight four hours ahead of me. So that's not going to show on my radar, but the dispatcher would be aware of it and could data link, call me up, uh, let me know uh, what to expect. So there are many sources in flight that are available to me. And one of the most useful ones would be uh, other pilots report, hey, it's it's really choppy here at this altitude. And you are listening to those broadcasts, air traffic control will let you know what another airplane has experienced. So there are a great many sources uh, available to you uh, for a given flight once you're underway uh, to help you to make the best decision. But ultimately it is the captain's decision uh, what you do with that information, whether you should continue or go somewhere else. And you mentioned the turbulence there, the choppy air. Uh, are there days when it's difficult to find smooth levels for flight? Yes, and unfortunately that uh, in a high density traffic area, let's say the Northeast, uh, a lot of airplanes are trying to use a, a limited space you may be aware that it's much smoother at a lower altitude, but that altitude is not available to you. Somebody else is already there. So uh, there are times when we know what's smooth, but we can't get there. Other times we can uh, hopefully make a request early if we're aware of it ahead of time. And you proactively uh, try your best to get the smoothest altitude that you can but there are limitations. You don't have an unlimited altitude capability. You, it may be smooth at 41,000 feet, but your airplane can't get there. It's, it, it's too heavy to go that high. So, and if you go too low, uh, you burn so much extra fuel that you may not have a, the, what you need to have with reserves to continue to your destination. So there are parameters that uh, limit you to uh, what might be the best possible ride, but you always try to achieve that. Very interesting. We want to get to our first viewer question. This comes from Bill in Virginia, and Bill writes, what additional work goes into pre-flight checks when weather is a factor? Well, when weather is a factor, it, let's say a, a, a typical example would be that uh, there are thunderstorms in the area, uh, and there's a likelihood that they may restrict our routing as we leave an airport. We won't be able to go the normal way. You uh, work that out. But let's, let's say a domestic flight would be a captain and a first officer. For international, typically, you have a captain and two first officers. You, you put your heads together and discuss uh, possible options. If we can't go this way, it looks like to me that uh, going more to the north northwest today would be a better choice. What do you think? And you uh, collectively build a plan so that you are ready should that occur, that you, you can choose something else than the normal way because the weather has now restricted what you would usually do to something that uh, may take you out of the way but is safer and smoother. And Steve, as a commercial pilot, do you typically fly the same route or routes uh, that you're assigned in a variety of different paths in a typical week? Most of us, I think, choose uh, to have some variety in the scheduling, especially with computerization of scheduling, makes that a, a pretty easy task to be able to, to uh, go to different places than rather than always the same place. Uh, if you want to, and, and the uh, you have what we call our seniority that allows you to choose something, some people like to fly to the same places, but I often would get the, the question, oh, so what route do you fly? And that's really from the old days when there weren't so many routes and people would fly the same place every time. And for myself, I did mostly uh, international and I like to change it up. I would do a, a Paris trip and the next week I might go to Frankfurt, Germany. And that was my preference. And 
uh, others I noticed seem to want to do that as well. I bet you've seen the Aurora Borealis and all kinds of amazing things on those North Atlantic uh, flights. We're looking forward to speaking Almost with every you. time. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's amazing. Well, uh, this is all great information so far. We want to continue our episode in just a couple of minutes. Coming up later in our WeatherWise segment, it's our latest edition of Is This Really a Thing? When we look at popular weather myths to see if they really are true, like are you safe if lightning hits your car? But coming up next, Steve is back to give us his expertise for the pilot seat on what you, the consumer, can do to plan for a better trip when flying. We're also answering more of your questions when Ask the Experts continues. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. Retired Captain Steve Fleischel is back with us to talk about weather and aviation. In our first segment, we talked about the information and planning a pilot goes through as they get ready to fly to us to our destinations each and every trip. And Steve, we want to get your take on how to help people travel better. You probably have some good insight on that. So we want to ask you to maybe take off your pilot hat for a moment and become a consumer. When it comes to the weather and traveling, are there things we can look at and plan for to have a better flying experience? I think so. When it comes to weather, especially summertime, when you have uh, rain showers or thunderstorms that it's common for them to move through a given area. If you select a flight that's early in the morning, we all know that's typically not when uh, bad weather occurs. And that's an easy choice to pick the earlier flight and also, if weather uh, were to cause delays, the airplane that's, that leaves first thing in the morning or early is probably already there. It doesn't have to get there. So later in the day, the airplane that you're going to take, it may be wonderful at where you're departing from, but that airplane uh, came had to come from an area where it experienced a delay uh, due to weather. So earlier is better. And if you are concerned or, or uncomfortable with bumpier conditions, if you want to call it that, then also later in the in the later in the day or or early evening typically is a smoother time. It's easier to find smoother air then than in the middle of the day. So that to me is a, a simple and an easy way to do and, and it's a little more pleasant. You get there sooner when you take that earlier flight. And if we do see a large storm system on its way into one part of the country, maybe a few days out, is it better to try to switch our plans early or should we try to stick it out and uh, fly even though we know there could be problems? My advice is to stick with your plan because the airline, in, in any airline, is, is really pretty good at managing that better than you would, you would be trying to guess at, at what kind of uh, situation you could improve upon. You don't know what airplanes are available or or what the uh, parameters are for an airline to, to work with, but they have to manage that all the time. So stick with the plan and let them uh, manage their part of it. That's part of what an airline provides is to get you there uh, the best possible way, the safest way, of course. So uh, I say stick with the plan. Don't try to second guess or come up with your own solution. Um, I just don't think it, you have a, a good chance of making a better one. And what are some of the biggest weather hazards that ultimately lead to delays? I would say that in my experience that whenever there are icy conditions where like freezing rain or 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 uh, uh ice and snow that requires de-icing, and there's a picture I think I see that maybe, that that takes a lot of time to take each airplane and spray it down with the de-icing fluid, and then you apply a second fluid to keep it from sticking on the wings. That is additional time that is, it just, you can't account for it. It's gonna uh, really ball things up. So that's one place where you would see the most amount of delay. Another one would be that anytime that it's not clear and wonderful, uh, let's say a busy airport like Atlanta, that if there's fog or 
are there restrictions where every single airplane is going to have to be doing an instrument approach? The air traffic control system can't handle as many airplanes as they can when it's clear they, the spacing requirements are, are very different uh, between airplanes. So uh, the improvements I saw at, toward the end of my career were that instead of holding airplanes, as we many of us have experienced, are in a holding pattern, they hold the airplanes at the point of departure instead because then they can sequence in and control the system so that air traffic control is not overwhelmed by the number of airplanes. Mo way better to be on the ground wishing you were in the air than being in the air wishing you were on the ground. That makes good sense. We do have a few more visit, uh, viewer questions, so we want to hear from Sean in San Francisco. Sean, uh, what do you want to ask the experts? What is one of the worst cases of flight delays or airport closures due to weather? I would say that, uh, once again, uh, I've seen the longest delays occur when uh, icy conditions required every airplane to be de-iced. And that just takes uh, an inordinate amount of time to be safe and to operate uh, within the parameters that uh need to be adhered to do you de-ice an airplane you only have a certain amount of time before you have to become airborne the de-icing fluid is not a forever thing if it continues to you have cold precipitation uh, that is going to uh, may even require you to go back to the gate because it took too long to get to the or a runway and take off before now you need to be de-iced again that's the the delays i've seen that have been the greatest is would be that. And second to that would be if you have to divert, let's say because a bad weather came in, uh, thunderstorms, and you, you can't uh, land at your intended time, you have to go to a different airport, refuel, and then get to the uh, original destination. That can take quite a bit of time. Otherwise, the delays are dramatically less, I would say. That makes good sense. Well, Steve, thank you so much for your insight. That does wrap up our question and answer segment. And we do want to thank retired pilot Steve Fleischel for joining us today. Steve, thanks again so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, up next, it is time for WeatherWise. Are you safe from lightning in a car? And also, are men more prone to getting struck by lightning than women? We're going to let you know if these are true or false when we come back. Welcome back to AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm your host, Jeff Cornish. It is time for Weather Wise, and in our segment, Is This Really a Thing? We reveal if popular things people say about the weather are fact or fiction. So let's start with a question. Are you safe from lightning in your car? Is this really a thing? And the answer is yes, at least for most of us. According to the National Lightning Safety Council, you are safest inside a hard-topped metal vehicle. When lightning hits, the shock is dispersed by the car's metal frame, keeping those inside the car safe. Next up, does lightning always hit the highest point? And superlatives are dangerous, especially in weather. If you say always or never, it typically does not work out well. So lightning does not decide what to strike. It depends on where the charge accumulates, and the bolt can easily bypass a taller object to hit a smaller one. Sometimes it even hits the flat ground. So it's not really a thing. Lightning does not always hit the highest point. In general, though, the path of least resistance is often to a taller or more isolated or even a pointy-shaped object where that charge can accumulate. Finally, are men struck by lightning more than women? Men are four times more likely to have a lightning strike than women. So when a storm hits, skies involved in outdoor activities are less likely to react to the lightning threat. So yes, more men are hit by lightning than women. So maybe we should hop off the golf course or get out of the boat maybe a little earlier. Thanks so much for joining us here on AccuWeather's Ask the Experts. I'm Jeff Cornish. Don't forget, when you have a question about weather, space, or science, you can write us or send us a video question at asktheexperts at accuweather.com. You can also call us at 888-566-6606. Have a great one.